Hello everyone, I'm Phil Dickens and this is From the Hill of Megiddo, the podcast serialisation of my book of the same name. In the last episode, Miles Darheen met his end very soon after finding out that the creatures hunting him were vampires. Now we must find out what that means for both his friends and their newfound foes in the supernatural world they have barely scratched the surface of. Let's get into it with the next four chapters. Chapter 8 Lydia rolled over and stretched her arm out, only to find the other side of the bed empty. She opened her eyes and sat up. Miles was most likely downstairs, pacing, ready to go. It was a wonder that she wasn't doing the same, in all honesty. Yet somehow, she had managed to drift off, if only for less than two hours, with a pulsing headache in the front of her skull as a reward. Downstairs, Kit was sitting around staring off into the distance. If how Lydia felt could be summed up in an image, it was that of him sitting on the couch as if his arms and legs were dead weights, and groaning every time he had to move his head. Only Jess seemed to have any energy, even though she had heavy bags under her eyes as well. She was pacing, but stopped when she saw Lydia and raised her eyebrows. I hope he didn't leave them too exhausted to come along with us. Lydia felt heat rush to her cheeks. No, we never... She glanced around. Where is he? He's not upstairs? No, I thought he'd come down here. Jess shook her head. Her eyes were wide and the lines on her forehead had deepened. Maybe he just went to the shops? Lydia suggested. Surely that would be it. He can't have been gone long. Maybe. Let's see. Jess took out her phone and rang Miles. The phone seemed to ring on endlessly. Kit latched onto the panic and dread that the two of them were feeling and came to hover around them by the stairs. Lots of frantic looks were exchanged, but nothing needing to be said. He quickly deduced that Miles was missing, and there was much bated breath as the phone continued to ring. Lydia heard the ringing stop and a muffled voice come through the speaker. Miles? Jess asked. Her voice was small, and there was too much doubt in it. Lydia knew right away that it wasn't Miles. She couldn't make out the words that the person on the other end of the line was saying, but she saw Jess's face drop, saw her knees buckle and her hand reach out for the wall, not quite reaching it. Kit caught her and lowered her to the ground, and she sat there, staring ahead and with the phone still attached to her ear. Kit took the phone off her, since she was in no state to deal with the call. He asked where they needed to go and what they needed to do, moving out of earshot as he did so. But Lydia wasn't listening anyway. Jess looked up and their eyes met. Jess's cheeks were streaked with tears, and they were welling in Lydia's eyes as well. No words had to be said, and no explanations given. She knew what had happened. Then a knock at the door shattered the silence, and Lydia cried out. It wasn't Miles. Well, it was. He had his thick brown hair and his chiselled jaw, his thick chest and flat stomach, both covered in a coarse layer of hair, his wide shoulders and strong arms. But whatever made him Miles was gone, and in his place was this... this... She couldn't even think the word. Tears welled in her eyes and the lump in her throat made it hard to breathe. She gasped when Kip put a hand on her shoulder. Then she nodded and put her hand over his. Next to the table, the pathologist was looking at her. Patient, but still expectant. That... that's... The tears rolled down in floods and her throat closed so that she couldn't get any more words out. She nodded, which thankfully was enough for him, and he put the sheet back over Miles. Jess needed no further encouragement to turn on her heel and head out to the mortuary. She lit up as soon as she was out in the open. You okay? Jack asked, after getting out of the car and heading over to her. The lump in her throat came back again. This time, she swallowed it down and blinked back the tears. She clenched her fists and let the adrenaline flow through her. She nodded. Yeah, I'm fine. He didn't look convinced. I can take you to your mum and dad's so you can tell them... No, she said. No, not yet. Not yet what? It asked as he came outside. Not going to be mum and dad's? Yes, you need to tell them. No, 
I'm not ready for that conversation yet. Their expression hardened. I am ready to find Gaz and Bri and anyone else involved in this and kill them. She saw the look the kid shared with Jack, but despite the doubt and worry she saw in their faces, neither of them said anything. With luck, it was because they knew the futility of trying to argue. The guild's office was in Bootle, four miles north of the centre of Liverpool. Known as Cyclades House, it stood next to the Strand Shopping Centre, the base of the building flanked on either side by a pub. The column that rose above the base, three wings coming out of the main tower to form what looked like a Y from above, but looked almost like a separate second building dropped on top of the first. There were no signs on the front or inside, indicating who the occupiers were. Not what I was expecting as far as secret hideouts go, Jess said as they got out of the car. Jack laughed and shook his head. You've been watching too much TV. Besides, it's not a hideout. Come on. He led them to the door and nodded to the guard on the desk before leading them through a second set of double doors and calling a lift. The lift arrived at the fifth floor and he led them from a bare, empty central room into the east wing. The wing was split into two large rooms. The first a library with bookshelves stretching across the walls and several tables and computer workstations. There were a couple of people inside who glanced up briefly to acknowledge Jack when he led the newcomers through into the next room. This room was deliberately sparse and open with tables spread apart from one another as much as possible, and several couches boxing off one corner of the room. A television attached to one wall was set on a news channel, facing a row of vending machines and a stand full of newspapers on the other. Jess felt a nudge in the back and turned to see Kit nodding head towards one of the tables. She felt a shiver down her arm and realised she was smiling because he had touched her. She frowned, punched him in the arm and shoved him ahead of her. There was a woman already there. She recognised her from the morning after Paddy's death. She looked younger than Jess, early twenties, maybe even late teens, with a frizz of strawberry blonde hair that fell to her shoulders. Hi, my name's Hazel, she said by way of introduction. And to get the supernatural weirdness out of the way first, I'm the Sentinel. What's that when it's at home? I told you about the guild being formed by warlocks, Jack said. They enhanced the strength, agility, reflexes and senses of seven of their most powerful warriors with magic to make them into sentinels whose power would put them at the forefront of the struggle against evil. They also made it so that these traits passed on to the firstborn child, meaning that there would be sentinels as long as the bloodlines persisted. Jess raised an eyebrow. Unto every generation there is a chosen one. Really? Hazel met Jess's stare with a straight face. Sorry, I'm still coming to grips with this vampires are real, let alone the concept of secret demon hunting societies and superhero bloodlines or whatever you want to call it. Hazel smiled. Yeah, I guess it is a lot to take in. So you're the ones being hunted by vampires? Jess's stomach tensed and she pushed the image of Miles' lifeless face away. Not all of us. They were after my brother. They were after your brother? Hazel said. Her eyes went across Jess, Lydia and Kit. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. You really sure you're up to this? Hazel asked. Jess shook her head. I'd rather not talk about it. Tell me how this works. Does being part of a secret vampire hunting society pay well? Hazel can cover that. I'll be back in a sec, Jack said before leaving the room. Hazel shrugged. Okay, well, there are a few people who help out on the side, but as a rule, the work consumes a lot of time. This isn't a shoestring operation. The guild's been around almost as long as human civilization, so they've built up assets. The pay's not mega bucks, but it's not minimum wage stacking shelves either. And tax free? Lydia asked. No. Why would it be tax-free? Uh, well, how, how do you tax a secret organisation? What's more suspicious? All the bugs being in order for an accountant company? Or lots of people in buildings being entirely unaccounted for? They'll take tax and national insurance, plus subscriptions if you join the recognised union. 
Lydia opened her mouth to reply, then closed it again and shook her head. When Jack returned, there was a man and a woman with him. The first thing that struck Jess was the familiarity of the man's face. He had the same eyes and same jawline as Miles. The resemblance wasn't close enough for an immediate family member, but was still striking. She shook her head. Miles was obviously playing in her mind. She squeezed Kit's hand, grateful when he squeezed back. This is poor than an isle, Jack said. Jess, Lydia and Kit are new additions to the guild. Several of their friends have been killed by vampires, and we have reason to believe it's systematic. I'm sorry, Anil said, glancing at each of them in turn. Jess swallowed, blinking away the threat of tears. Quoth spoke up. We've come here looking for the champion of man. With everything that's going on, it's not infeasible that these vampires are hunting for them as well. Champion of man? It said. He put his hand on Jess's back, and she closed her eyes as she felt the warmth on her skin. A champion of man is someone born with preternatural strength and power. If the vampires were targeting your friends, it could be because they have reason to believe that it's one of you. Puth looked at Anil, then back at Kit. Does any of you have a mark? It would be small, no bigger than the 5p coin, but it looked like a sword. Jess suddenly felt lightheaded and couldn't breathe. Miles, Kit said. He has a mark like that on his thumb. He always said it was a birthmark. Then he's the champion. And I said, where is he? Jess burst into tears. You have to tell her, Mike said. She either finds out now that this is necessary, or learns later that this is part of the work and asks, did you have to do that to my brother? Jack looked around, and Hazel nodded their agreement. He sighed. They were right, of course, but since he had earlier seen the cracks in Jess's apparent coping mechanism of shoving her grief down and focusing on the desire for revenge, he was unsure of how well she would take the news. I can talk to her if you don't want to, Hazel offered. He shook his head. No, I'll do it. Go on, everyone's already got work to do. This is mine. Nobody argued. They left the small office they had been gathered in and set to the tasks they had for the day. Jack loitered for several moments, collecting his thoughts, before heading back to where Jess and her friends were gathered. They were talking amongst themselves in low voices, stopping and looking up when he came into the room. Everything alright? Yeah, we're fine, Jess said. Her eyes were still red, but her expression had hardened and her mouth was set into a frown. Just wondering how much longer the induction goes on for, and when we can get out there and do some fighting. It was as good an opening as any. Well, it's not exactly fighting, but I do need to head out now. He sighed. Look, I need to tell you. When someone's been killed by vamps, one of the things we need to do is examine the body and make sure they haven't been turned. If they have, we need to make sure they don't rise. Jess swallowed, but retained their composure. So, cut off their heads. There was a pause. Miles's head. Kit put his arm around her. She reached out and gripped his free hand in her own. Yeah, look, I'm sorry you've got to process all this, but I didn't want to keep anything from you. No, thanks. She looked at Kit, then at Lydia, before finally turning back to Jack and nodding. I want to come with you. Yes, Lydia said. I need to do this. Jack didn't argue. I'm going now. Come if you want, but just you, because a trip to the mortuary really isn't a group excursion. Despite the pleading looks from her friends, Jess kept her resolve and followed him out of the room. Jack had a funny feeling in his gut when he pulled up by the mortuary, even though at first sight nothing looked out of the ordinary. Trusting his instinct, he took a short bladed machete from the boot of his car and secured the sheath under his suit jacket before heading inside. Jess, who had been wrapped up in her own thoughts the whole journey, raised an eyebrow, but once he passed her a weapon as well, she focused almost instantly and followed behind him without any questions. She had the makings of an excellent fighter. When they reached the front desk, 
They were greeted with the sight of the security guard slumped back in his chair, his neck a bloody mess. They drew their blades pretty much simultaneously. Jack held his breath a moment and listened, but could hear no voices or movements in the vicinity. He led the way into the main corridor. There was nobody else, living or dead, in the corridor. The door to the coroner's office was closed, normally a sure sign that he had left for the day. Except, of course, that Jack had spoken to Dr Nelson not 40 minutes ago. Jack pushed the door open wide enough to see the shape slumped against the wall. The lights were off, but enough came in from the corridor that he could see the shredded flesh of the corpse's neck. He pulled the door closed again, then looked back at Jess and shook his head before they moved on. Their movements were slower now, each footstep more deliberate. They headed towards the steel double doors at the bottom of the corridor, beyond which the body would have been laid out ready for him. He reached out towards the door handle, and Jess cried out as something hit her in the face. Before Jack could turn, a hand grabbed his arm, twisting it behind his back. The machete dropped to the floor. Another hand wrapped around his throat, the nails cutting into his flesh. Now, now. Let's not get ahead of ourselves here. Chapter 9 A jolt shook his spine as he landed. It knocked the wind out of him and his head spun. A hand gripped the top of his head and he felt its claws dig into his skull. He went to lash out and another hand pinned his arm down. A weight pressed down on his chest and there was a hot breath against his neck. He thrashed but the weight wouldn't shift. He kicked out but this only earned him a blow to the ribs. Then teeth cut into his neck. He cried out as they drew blood. As the attacker sucked at his neck, he began to feel lightheaded. He shifted his weight and tried to roll. He got nowhere, but craned his head enough to sink his own teeth into the, atta into the attacker's neck. A punch to the chest winded him again, and a chunk of flesh tore from the assailant's neck when his head snapped back. Blood ran into his mouth. He spluttered. Then the attacker bit down again. Miles gasped and opened his eyes. He winced from the glare of the lights and turned his head. There was a hollow clanking sound as he shifted, and he realised he was laying on a metal table. He sat up and looked about. Two rows of metal cabinets lined the walls, and a small tray of tools sat next to the table he was on. Other than that, the room was empty, sterile. Looking down, he saw that he was covered by a thin white sheet, and he lifted it up, and nothing on underneath. He put a hand to his neck where he remembered being bitten. The skin was rough but unbroken. Huh. None of this made any sense. He climbed off the table, dragging the sheet with him. He wrapped it around his waist and stepped towards the door. Dum, dum, dum. The sound exploded in Miles' ears. And he winced, doubling over and stepping away from the door. His head pounded in time with the sound. A sharp smell flooded his sinuses. Rich, tangy and metallic, his legs trembled and he fell to his knees. He pressed his forehead to the ground. Dum, dum, dum. The smell was overwhelming and intoxicating. His stomach roiled. Dum, dum, dum. He felt the skin around his eyes tighten and his lips draw back. He looked down at his hands, his vision still shifting in and out of focus, and watched the skin yellow drawing in tight like leather bound to his bones as his nails extended to sharp points. The rumbling in his stomach rose to his throat, escaping his mouth as a low growl. He forced himself to his feet. Another growl escaped his mouth, the ache in the pit of his stomach growing with the noise in his head. He grabbed the door and yanked it open. The wooden frame splintered around the hinges, and the door itself hung lopsided. He stalked out of the room and into the softer light of the hallway. Immediately, the smell overpowered him, and he clutched at his stomach. Did it growl, or did he? Hi there, sleepyhead. Miles became aware of a man ahead of him, restrained, with a bloody neck. It was the creature holding him that spoke, wearing the same gnarled face as the creatures who had killed Michelle and Paddy, and had tried to kill him. Not tried, he realised. Succeeded. His face must have looked the same. Who the fuck are you? He hissed. The creature laughed. Come on now, it said. Don't be like that. There was a grunt of pain from the man as he was pushed to his knees and his head was forced forward. I brought you your tea. Dum, dum, dum. 
Miles stalked forward, sniffing. The metallic tang of blood called to him. Dum, dum, dum. Miles' body tensed as he stood over the man, staring down at the back of his neck as the sound of the blood cursing through his veins filled Miles' head. He leaned forward, his mouth filling with saliva. Eat up. There was a groan nearby, and that was when he noticed his sister sprawled on the floor. She pushed herself up off the ground, her nose bloody, and their eyes met. He saw the recognition in her eyes, followed by the realisation of revulsion as she took him what he was now. There were tears in her eyes, but she was gritting her teeth. He turned and threw a punch. He caught the vampire across the chin and sent it crashing to the ground. He growled again, shoved the man out of the way and leapt at the monster. As it tried to sit up, he bashed its head into the ground, then slammed his fist into its face. It squirmed under him and he shifted his weight while still driving punches into its face. It headbutted him. He headbutted it back, then wrapped his hands around its throat, squeezing and digging his nails in until he felt blood ooze slowly over his hands. He pulled the vampire's head up and wrapped his arms around its neck, one hand gripping his chin and the other holding the back of its head. He wrenched as hard as he could, feeling bones crack and pulled upwards. He shifted his weight so that he could place his knee on the creature's chest for leverage. He continued wrenching and pulling until finally he stumbled backwards. He still had the head in his arms, but the body slumped back to the ground. Shit! He cried out and dropped the head. Had he really done that? His skull felt as though it was crushing his brain. The sound of blood pumping crashed through his ears. The smell of blood was making his stomach ache with need. He looked towards the man, who was still on his knees, and now staring at him. Jess was on her feet now, also staring. All Miles could see was the blood on his neck and coming from her nose. He could smell it, and his stomach groaned. He growled, leering at them. There was only one thing Miles could do then. He turned and ran. The police won't be long, Jack said. We should go, because while I have a badge, there are some questions it won't make go away. Don't we... Shouldn't we be feeding them a cover story or something? She could still hear her heartbeat pounding in her ears. She doubted her hands would stop shaking that night. It was a wonder that her legs were keeping her upright. I mean, so that the truth doesn't get out? The best cover stories are the rationalisations people come up with themselves. Plus, it's not like one missing body and another with a deformed face are definitive proof of vampires. At worst, there might be another urban legends doing the round with the police. Something might pop it up on a conspiracy theory website. He shrugged. Oh. The deformed face. She looked down at it again. Miles' face had been deformed in the same way. He had been just like Gaz and Bry when they had shown up at their house. Except more feral. As if he wasn't in control of it. As if he wasn't him anymore. Or he wasn't, was he? Are you okay? Yeah. Yes. I'm as okay as I'm likely to be tonight. Good enough. Come on. They left. There was no attempt to clean up the bodies or mask what had happened. What had she expected? Men in black suits sweeping away the evidence and wiping people's memories? No, that was daft. It also wasn't the most pressing concern they had when Miles was out there somewhere. Dangerous. He didn't try to attack us. He killed that other vampire, she said. Newly turned vampires are feral, unpredictable. I know what you're thinking, but it's not really Miles, not anymore. I know it's hard right now, but what needs to happen next will be a lot harder if you don't find a way to accept that. What needs to happen next? She didn't need to ask what that meant. They had to find and kill her brother before he killed somebody else. Miles collapsed in a doorway, clutching his stomach. He wasn't aware whether the people who passed him gave him a second glance, stared, or ignored him completely. But he could hear the heartbeat of everyone. He could feel the blood pumping through their veins, and he wanted to taste it. He curled into a ball, not trusting himself to move. Finally, the flow of people slowed, then stopped altogether. He looked up as the last embers of sunlight disappeared below the skyline. Over the road, two people were pulling down the shutters of a shop. He pushed himself up to his feet and peered around the doorway. Similar scenes were happening all the way down the street. As he watched, a woman stepped out of the shop about halfway down the street 
and the smell of fresh blood flooded his nostrils once again. He stalked towards the smell. The woman had gone and the smell had faded when the door closed, but it still lingered at the back of his throat. He suppressed a growl, not wanting to draw any attention to himself, or any more than he already was, grey-faced and wearing only a sheet tied around his waist. He sped up into a jog as he crossed the street and shoved the door open. Hello, the butcher said, his back still to Miles. How can I help you? He had turned around. I'm closing now. I don't want any trouble. The smell of blood mingled with sweat and the faintest hint of piss. Fear, he knew almost instinctively. It made the ache in his stomach grow and his chest tighten. He swallowed against the saliva building up in his mouth. Blood. I need blood. The butcher's breath quickened. He stepped backwards and Miles found himself stalking around the corner. When the man hit the door, his eyes widened and his scent intensified. Miles growled and the man shoved the handle down, throwing himself through the door. Miles charged and tackled him to the ground. He sniffed at the man's neck and bared his fangs. No! The butcher cried out. Miles forced his head back from the man's neck. Brum, brum, brum. The pulse was all but calling to him, and he wanted it. There was nothing more important in that moment than giving in to his own hunger, feeling the relief as the blood flowed from the open vein. He squeezed his eyes shut. I can't. I, I can't do this. Help me. Blood. There's blood there. Take that, please. There was a pig carcass hanging from the ceiling. It was fresh the blood draining from its neck into a container on the floor. Miles leapt up and snatched the container, pouring it down his throat. As much splashed on him or onto the floor as it went, as went in his mouth, but the relief was total. The ache in his stomach faded, the pounding in his head receded, both the pain and the sound of the man's heart beating. He sighed and let his shoulders slump. He felt the skin loosen around his eyes. He brought his hand up in front of his face and saw the skin return to a very pale pink. His veins were no longer visible and his nails had retracted. The butcher grunted as he struggled back to his feet. Um, sorry about that, Miles said. I lost control or, uh, something. It's hard to explain. Look, mate, I don't give a shit. The butcher raised his hands in the air. Just don't hurt me. Miles gestured to the pig carcass. Can you get me this regularly? The blood, I mean. He raised his own hands in the air, palms towards the man. I promise next time I'll be able to give you some kind of payment. And there'll be less tackling. Yeah, sure, I can do that. The butcher was giving Miles a look that said the last thing he wanted to do was have to see him ever again. But he lowered his hands. What are you? Miles looked down, then back at the butcher. Naked and in need of a wash. Don't suppose you could help me there too? He shrugged apologetically. I, I am sorry about attacking you. The butcher looked back at the door, then at Miles and the blood around his mouth. Finally, he nodded. Jazz sat down on the curb and lit another cigarette. They were still waiting on the fourth for their little raiding party. Will who had insisted that his prior errand wouldn't take very long at all, and yet hadn't been seen for several hours. Will's lover, Nat, kept pacing back and forth over the same four paving stones and staring into the distance as if expecting him to materialise at any moment. He'd have been here by now, Bry said. So either he's still dealing with the dead kid, or... He's not dead, she snapped. He's not. Bry caught Gaz's eye. Gaz frowned and stood up again. Nat, we can't wait for him forever. It's his fault for going out last night against orders and for getting clumsy. So he's got to fix it, but we've got a job to do. She faced him again, glowering. After a few moments, she sighed and looked away. Fine. Gaz looked across the road at the 19-storey building, only a few lights still on higher up the tower. Then back at Nat and Bry. Besides, think of all the fun that we get to have if this fellow has the info that we think he does. There you are. An aisle turned to see Puth, standing about five feet behind her, hands in his pockets. She smiled before turning back the way she was facing. She continued to watch the big wheel turn, 
lit up against the black night sky. The water between it and her was also black, cut through with the blue and gold reflection of the lights on the piazza. He was born not far from here, she said, her voice low and soft. The banks had broken and the area was flooded with mud when the adversary came for him. She felt his hand on her shoulder. I know. You always used to tell me that story when I was a child. He kept his hand on her shoulder. She stopped staring at the wheel and looked up at him. None of this was your fault, you know. No. She shook her head. This boy, Miles, he should have been my ward. Now he's dead. Worse, a vampire. Because I wasn't there. Wolf sat down next to her. Anna, you can't think like that. Why not? He hesitated. He had no answer, she thought, because there wasn't one. It wasn't your fault, he repeated. She sighed. Either way, what hope have we got now? Nuada was too strong for anybody but another champion to take on. Yeah, he agreed, before trailing off. This time, he really didn't have an answer. Lydia wasn't sure what to feel. Since seeing Miles' body lying lifeless on that cold metal table, she'd been numb. There had been that first rush of tears, her eyes red and her chest and throat sore from how much she had wept. But after that, there was nothing. Jess was holding on to her anger to keep, to keep her going. But Lydia was just going. If she stopped, she wasn't sure that she could start again. But now, Miles was still alive. Alive again, rather. Or something close to it. Surely that couldn't be real. And if it was, did it mean that they hadn't lost him after all? Or that they had just lost him in a different way? Jack and Hazel had both said that vampires were a distorted reflection of the person they had been in life. But not actually that same person. But Jess said he had killed the other vampire and not attacked her or Jack. Lydia wanted it to still be Miles. But didn't want to relive the grief of losing him if she built her hopes on that and it wasn't true. She wasn't sure what to feel, except tired. I need to go home, she said. I don't want to spend too long away from the baby right now. They had been in the gym on the 19th floor of Cyclade's house, running through armed and unarmed fighting drills, before they had been pulled away to hear the news about Miles. Lady had built up quite a sweat doing it, and been on the verge of breaking through the numbness, but now her muscles were sore and burning, there was no way she was up to resuming the session. I'll give you a lift home, Mike said. None of you ought to be going anywhere on your own right now. She couldn't argue with that, so she accepted a lift gratefully. Mike didn't talk much during the journey. He recognised that she wasn't up to engaging in conversation right then, and let the trip pass in silence. Once they were parked up outside the house, he asked, Who's your babysitter? My cousin, Cassie. Does she know about all of this? God, no. She'd have a fit and try and get me sectioned or something. I just told her I was starting a new job with other hours. Well, that's... The car window shattered and glass sprayed everywhere. Lydia screamed and pressed herself against the door. Somebody she couldn't see grabbed Mike by the shoulders and dragged him through the broken window. She poured her air door handle then nearly fell out onto the road as it was yanked open from outside. A hand grabbed her hair. A shock of pain bit at her scalp. She yelped and lashed out, managing only to kick the shin of her attacker. It was enough, and as they howled, she managed to get herself upright and break into a run. She didn't head into her house. For a start, the door didn't necessarily offer any protection, but more than that, she didn't want to bring this anywhere near her daughter. With everything else, that would be more than she could stand right now. Their only hope was to pick a direction and hope that she could outrun them. Go on then, get her, a voice commanded. She tore down the hill and around the corner past the local church, but she could still hear their feet stamping the pavement behind her. The few other people she passed on the street stopped and stared, but rather than try to help they just got out of the way. She turned up the next side street after the church and rounded the corner. Looking back, she couldn't see anybody. She reached the end of the alley, and there was a blow in her side, and a shove sent her stumbling. She scrambled away on all fours, until a pair of legs blocked her path. She struggled to get back to her feet, 
Put a hand on her shoulder, shoved her to the floor. Stay down, Bint. A female voice. Laughter. She crawled towards the wall. Her attacker shoved her backwards again. She raised her leg, kicking as hard as she could. The vampire cried and stumbled. Lydia shoved herself up off the ground and ran, only to have a hand grab her hair and yank it backwards. She smacked her head on the pavement. Everything went grey, streaks of white flashing across her vision. There was a buzzing in her pocket, probably Cassie ringing to see why she wasn't there yet. Late as always, so unreliable. No consideration. All the usual ranting. She rolled onto her side, curled into a fetal position, waiting for more blows to come. None did. She was vaguely aware of shouting, then the sounds of a scuffle. Cries, grunts, a scream. She pushed herself onto all fours, still clutching her head in her hands, and braved to look around. Everything was still grey, and as she turned her head, her vision spun, and bile rose in her throat. She lowered her head back into her hands. Lydia! She felt herself being lifted off the ground. Lydia, are you okay? She tried to look at her rescuer, but again she felt sick. She squeezed her eyes shut and groaned. I'll take that as a no. He walked her down the street, propping her up with an arm around her shoulders and one on her stomach. Try and stay awake. You might have a concussion. Lydia opened her eyes again. Her vision was still shaky, but it didn't make her want to throw up. So that had to be an improvement. Slowly, delicately, she turned her head to look at... Miles? Yeah, it's me. I'm here. It can't have been. She had hit her head hard and must have been hallucinating. Jess said you were a vampire now? Let's worry about you first, eh? That seemed sensible. She closed her eyes again and leaned into his shoulder as they walked. Lydia appeared to be a lot less shaky by the time they reached her house. She was walking unaided, though nursing her side. Mars could hear a heartbeat in his head, though it didn't hurt as it first had with the man in the mortuary. She caught him looking at her and smiled. I think the weirdest part is how okay I am with it, she said. She pulled the key out of her pocket and opened the front door. I mean, that might just be because I'm concussed or because you just saved my life. But mostly I think it's because I'm glad that you're okay. She stepped inside, then looked back at him. Oh, uh, do I need to invite you in or something? He held up a hand. Don't. The whole sunlight bit appears to be bollocks. I found that out from it still being daylight when I barged out of the mortuary half naked. I wish I'd seen that, she said with a smile. Trust me, you don't, he said, though he felt heat creeping up his face. Anyway, if the sunlight thing's false, then it's worth testing out the other stuff too. He stepped over the threshold and nothing happened. But uh guess that one's a bust too. Lydia? Cassie said as she came into the hallway. Where have you... Oh my god, what happened? Some drunk woman attacked her, Miles said. Cassie shot him a scathing look. It's true, Cass. The bitch came out of nowhere. Lydia said. Hmm. Well, as long as you're going to be okay. Another dark look at Miles. He cleared his throat. I'd best let you get some rest anyway. You're going to be okay? Miles... Wait, would you mind staying over tonight? Now Cassie turned her stare on Lydia. Oh, fuck off. I'm a grown woman. She sniffed. Yeah. Well, Sazie's sleeping peacefully, so I'll leave you to it. She said hardly another word in the time it took her to gather her bag and leave, throwing one last black look to both of them on the way out. Lydia rolled her eyes. Sorry about that. It's all right. You sure you're okay with me staying over? Have you got anywhere else to go? Uh, well, no. He had no idea if Jess had told his parents he was dead, so home was out of the question. Well, it'd feel good to have you here with me at the moment. He smiled at him. Miles could see the worry in her face. Not that he blamed her, after everything that had happened to them in the last month even without the attack tonight. Okay, sure. Thanks. It means a lot. She kissed him. No funny business just yet, though, alright? 
I'm really glad to have you back, or whatever you want to call it. But that doesn't mean it's not still weird. He laughed. Fair enough. Can't really argue there. On the way upstairs, he passed the mirror and noted that he still had a reflection. But even if the face staring back at him looked human, the pallor given him by death was still obvious enough. Chapter 10 Everything ached. Mike opened his eyes to a blare of orange light. He squinted and turned his head, but when he went to raise his hand against the light he found that he couldn't move. His vision cleared enough to see that he was bound to a chair. He turned his head and squinted, trying to stop the blood from getting into his eye. It didn't work. He grimaced against the sting. The gathering in the middle of the warehouse paid him no mind. The tall Eastern European vampire, Christoph, paced back and forth in front of them in long strides. He had introduced himself earlier, and the pain Mike now bore was his work. I think we can all be proud of our achievements so far, Christoph said. Events have barely began to unfold, yet our numbers swell daily, and already we have removed the champion of man from the equation. We should be proud of that, and those we've lost have played their part as well. But we cannot get complacent. The stinging subsided enough for Mike to open his cut eye. He put his vision through a blurry pink filter. He squeezed his eyes shut again, and it took a couple of seconds before he could clearly see again through his other eye. Whilst the champion is no longer a threat in the same way as previously, he remains a wild card. Christoph shook his head. What happened to Will demonstrate that fact? Not to speak of the fact that the boy should not have been turned at all. Nat, you will find him, bring him in, and right your lover's wrong. Mike watched the female vampire stiffen and clench her fists. But she didn't glare for long before she broke from the front of the crowd and stormed out of the building. Nobody else appeared to react. The rest of you will follow Gaz and Bry, Christoph continued. The guild may already realise what is coming. We need to ensure that they cannot act upon this knowledge and move against us, which is why our ne next task will be distraction. It will be hard for them to interfere if Liverpool is consumed by chaos. That was when he turned and gestured to Mike. Our new friend from the guild, Mr Jones, has been kind enough to show us how we might make that happen. Miles rubbed his side as he and Lydia strolled along the waterfront. Despite the ache, it felt good to be wearing clothes that fit him again. He looked at her and smiled. She smiled back. Are you okay? I guess so, he said. But, I mean, we need to figure out what we're going to do about, you know. He waved a hand in the air. Christ, this is so fucked up. I mean, how do you even react to all this shit? I... Ugh. He put his hands over his face. My head hurts. She squeezed his arm. I know. He lowered his hands and looked at her. One eyebrow raised. She shrugged. Well, I know what you mean about not knowing what to do at any rate. I need to see Jess and Kit. And tell them what? They'd stopped next to a car park. Both them to the left, the Echo Arena bathed them in shadow. I told you what Jess said to me on the phone. Aaron Jack saw you when you woke up. They think you might be more dangerous than other vampires because of your powers. They didn't see what I saw last night, so they're not going to believe. I know, he said, and I have no particular desire to be staked or beheaded. Apparently, a wooden stake through the heart doesn't kill vampires. He frowned and swallowed. Well, I certainly don't fancy that. But if I'm this champion of man that they're talking about, then I can't just sit by while everything kicks off. Now, she took out a pack of cigarettes and lit one up. Or if you just announce yourself, then they'll cut your head off. She passed him the cigarette and lit another one up. Let me go back and talk to them first. Explain it, so that they don't attack you. He watched the smoke flow out of his mouth as he exhaled. Fine, he said. But I'm not sitting by the phone waiting for a call. I'm still getting used to all these new sensors, but I'm pretty sure I can find others like me. He caught her expression and smiled. I'll be fine. Come on. We were going to do this anyway, even before I was superpowered and undead. This isn't a fucking joke. She punched him in the arm. I know that we all agreed to get into this. I know that you being a champion or whatever means you can't just sit on the bench with all that's happening. I know all that. I just don't want anything to happen to you. Not... Tears welled up in her eyes. Not now. 
Not when you come back from the dead is the only part of this insanity I'm sure I can cope with. She squeezed her eyes shut, opened them again and cleared her throat. Promise me you'll be safe, alright? Fair enough. He flicked the column of ash off the end of his cigarette, then touched her arm with his free hand. I promise I'll be fine. I swear. That'll have to do, I suppose. She said with a smile. The lone Bobby who had been called out to examine the area seemed utterly nonplussed by the new arrivals. It was, after all, just a car with broken windows, hardly the crime of the century, or a great mystery as far as what had happened. Nonetheless, he was happy enough to defer to Jack and take the opportunity to go and get a coffee. I think he's still alive, Joel said. Jack nodded agreement. There'd be no sense in moving the body rather than leaving it here. And if that was the case, why not move the car as well? Exactly. But to have ambushed them here, they would have had to have followed them from Cyclade's house. So they were after someone from the guild, which suggests they're after information. He kept looking at Hazel as he spoke, as if for validation of what he was saying. About what though? If this was the vamps who were after the champion, then they'd have to know more than us about what's coming. So maybe it's about us, Hazel said. They want a way to keep us busy so we don't interfere with their plans. Whatever they are. Jack nodded. It made sense, given the fact that they were huddled around an empty car rather than picking over a cordoned off crime scene with a body. There wasn't even any blood in the immediate vicinity, so if Mike had put up a fight, he'd been overpowered quickly. We need to find them. Ideally, while Mike is still alive. Just wish we knew where to start. Well, I still need to follow up a lead on a regular stalking ground for a group of vamps. Don't know if it's the same law, but it's a good starting point as any. Jack nodded. Are we going tonight? Joel asked. I am. Aze. No, listen. This isn't exactly your skill set. I can fight. Yeah, that's not what I meant. We're not just ploughing into a club with swords and hoping for the best. I'll need to blend in there to scope the place out. Oh. Several beats of silence followed. Joel lowered his eyes to the ground and his cheeks flushed red. Jack felt sorry for him. He was very young and clearly far more at ease with books than with people. Although that was expected if he was following in his father's footsteps as mentor to the Sentinel. But he clearly didn't want to just be there for research and theory. Plus, Jack had noticed the way the lad kept looking at Hazel. Alright, will you follow that lead tonight? Jack said. Best thing we can do is make sure we're as well informed as possible on the champion. No do I and Dawn and anything else we need to know about. Hazel and Joel both nodded their agreement. That at least opened the space for Jack to suggest that they get back to Cyclade's house. Where he would at least be able to distance himself from any more awkward moments. Jess saw Lydia's car pull up on the other side of the road and wiped her eyes with her free hand. She took the last drag of her cigarette and dropped it on the floor, stubbing it under her foot. She waved as Lydia got out and crossed the road. Once she was across, the two of them hugged fiercely. Jess squeezed her eyes shut and willed the tears not to come. She was sure Lydia felt her shake with silent sobs, but she didn't react, and when the hug ended, she smiled. How are you doing, chick? I'm alright. Jess lit up another cigarette, since it was the chain smoking that maintained her pretense to calm. All this vampire stuff's keeping me occupied, I guess, even if none of it makes any sense. Lydia stroked her arm. The silence hung heavy between them for a moment before Kit came out of the building. So? Jess said. What's the matter? Lydia glanced into the building, as though she was worried about eavesdroppers from inside. Jess stretched out her free hand and they found Kits. They were both looking at Lydia. She bit her lip and looked straight at Jess. Jess could see her best friend's hands trembling. She had sounded nervous and fidgety over the phone, which only made Jess more anxious to know what was happening. Okay, Lydia said. This is going to sound mental. Well, I suppose that pretty much describes everything right now, but, I mean... Jess, you know how you said Miles had been made into a vampire? Well, uh, basically, I've seen him. Jess's stomach tensed. You did? Did he... 
you saved me. Lydia cast her eyes across the three of them. Last night, when Mike was taken, like I said, I managed to run away from them. I didn't get very far, though. One of them caught up with me and had me pinned on the ground. Miles managed to overpower her, and he rescued me. Jess let go of Kit's hand, stepped forward, and put both hands on Lydia's shoulders. Wait, Miles saved you from them? Last night? Yeah, Lydia smiled. I was concussed, so he took me home as well and made sure I was okay. She must have caught Jess's luck. Nothing happened, but in the morning we went for breakfast and he told me the full story. He hasn't drank human blood. If he does, then he thinks that something will take over his body. He says he's managed to suppress the craving with pig's blood from a butcher, so he's still him. Really? Are you sure? What was I am? Yeah, but... She could feel the doubts weighing on her. Too many. She wanted to believe. The hope. But that want in part was what made her doubt. Yes, look at me. We've known each other our whole lives, and you know I'm telling the truth. All that other crazy shit's real, so why not this? He's a vampire, yeah. But not a bad one. He's still Miles. I swear. I promise. Yes, sighed. Okay, say it's true. Then what? I don't know. I've no idea. That's why I told you first. Telling everyone that story might be a start. It said. Jess felt tears welling in her eyes. Dare she allow herself to believe it? Her brother was alive, or as close to it as this madness she found herself caught up in would allow, at any rate. She sniffed and wiped her tears away. Okay, we'll tell everyone. We can do it together, sooner rather than later is best, I reckon. She gripped Lydia's hands. Apparently she had already chosen hope, or possibly madness if that's what it was, over disbelief. Then I want to go and see him. Miles hesitated as he reached the door to the warehouse. It was still day, though it was getting progressively cooler and the light was dimming. The area he was in, near the docks, was largely deserted and he couldn't quite explain what had brought him here. It wasn't a smell, or a sound or anything else tangible, but he knew it was where he needed to be. He pushed the door and it creaked open. There goes the element of surprise, he muttered before stepping inside. The main room was bare but for a pile of old crates at one end and a battered armchair and couch in the opposite corner. There was nobody around but the smell of blood was strong. He followed his nose over to the battered furniture. Behind the couch, a wooden chair had been knocked over. It was stained with blood, and there was frayed rope wrapped around the arms. There was no visible trail, but he could smell that whoever had bled had gone through the small door in the back corner. Miles ran over and opened the door. Behind it, there was a man on the floor. A bloody, huddled mess, but still breathing. Miles turned him over onto his back, the man gasped and tried to squirm away. Hey, hold on, it's okay. I'm not one of them. The man looked up at Miles, then his eyes drifted beyond him. There was someone there. Something hit him hard on the back of the head. Pain rippled through his skull. He cried out and fell to the floor. His ears were ringing and he was seeing stars. You fucking well won't be one of us when I'm finished. The voice was female. Miles looked up and saw her standing over him with a sledgehammer in her hand. He just had time to recognise her as the vampire who had been attacking Lydia, and who had fled after he had knocked it down, as she raised the weapon over her head. Miles rolled out of the way just in time, the hammer cracking the floor where he had been. He grabbed the handle and kicked her in the gut. When she doubled over, he brought his fist down on the back of her neck. She fell to her knees, he snatched the sledgehammer and lifted it over his head. His head swam and he staggered. The woman kicked him in the ankle and he stumbled backwards. She sat up and he recovered himself to swing the sledgehammer into her face. Blood erupted from her mouth and nose. He swung again. The woman's cheek caved in, blood and bones shattering across the floor. Her screams hurt his ears. He swung again, and once more for good measure, what was left of her head burst like rotten fruit. He dropped the hammer and stumbled over to the man on the ground. Hey, mate, are you still with me? The man coughed, blood dribbling out of his mouth. Shit, stay with me. I'll get you to a hospital. You'll be fine. He put an arm under the man's shoulders. No. The man made a weak attempt to shove him away. It didn't work, but Miles moved his arm anyway. Find them, stop them, before they release the wolves. 
He coughed again, turning his head to spit blood across the floor. The wolves? Miles nodded. Where? Who's going to release them? But the man couldn't answer. He'd stopped breathing. Not long after the sun had set that night, a group of seven men and eight women sat shackled in cells in the basement of a derelict-looking three-story Georgian building close to the city centre. Each was naked, their clothes neatly folded into a corner, though they didn't seem conscious of their nudity. Once they were settled, their jailer went around the room, closing and locking the door to each cage in turn, whilst bidding them a good night. It was a strange sentiment, but they all returned it amiably enough. Soon, the only sounds were the low breathing of each cage's occupants and the slow tick-tock of the grandfather clock, a story above, the only finishing on the dark and dusty ground floor of the house. Then, far out of sight of the caged men and women, the full moon rose in the sky. The jailer stood at the foot of the stairs and watched as those he had imprisoned screamed. Their transformation was rapid and brutal. Their backs broke and their bodies shook. Their skin turned as black as coal and their bodies reshaped themselves, hands and feet becoming paws, nails becoming claws, and mouths stretching to snouts filled with razor fangs. At the end of the process, each cage was filled with a wolf, over eight feet long, without fear, eyes glowing red. They padded restlessly around the mess of blood, hair and mucus their transformation left on the floor. The jailer didn't hear anybody come up behind him. He saw the wolves turn and growl in his direction, seconds before his neck snapped. He fell to the floor, dead, and the vampire who had killed him took the keys to the wolves' cages from his pocket. The streets heaved with people. A thousand varieties of music blared from the surrounding buildings, creating a din over which it was difficult to hear much else. The leering looks that she got on their way to Sanguine made Hazel conscious of what she was wearing. Besides being tight enough that she felt as though she was stuck partway through breathing in, their course had pushed their boobs up so much that she was sure she could have rested her chin on them. Being ill ruled wasn't her main concern, however, it was not fitting in. Katie had done an excellent job with her makeup, the thick black eyeliner and dark purple lipstick making an interesting contrast with her red hair. She also liked how she looked in the clothes. The short skirt with the long tail and spiderweb leggings, the heavy metal plated boots, the choker and the gloves which reached up her arms past the elbows. As Katie had put it when she was finished, she looked well fit, but she wasn't used to dressing like this, so surely it would show. Having Katie come with her helped in that regard. She had to catch a woman who didn't so much bump into as fall over her. She leaned the woman against the wall. A panhandler wandered down the street, asking everyone whose eye he caught for 50 pence. She had to avoid or push away more than one passing man's wandering hands. In an empty doorway, a man hunched over and vomited, all of which was pretty standard. Beyond the way the people dressed, there wasn't much difference between Sanguine and any other club, she realised as they went past the bouncer and inside. Live music, in this case something fast-paced and electronic, in a dark space illuminated by strobing and blinking multicoloured lights. Clusters of people on the dance floor, some throwing shapes and others standing in a circle and sort of swaying, and many more around the walls or propping up the bar. That was where they headed now, to order drinks. Hazel wasn't here to fight tonight, which was fortunate that given that her outfit hardly made that practical, so she could afford to take in some alcohol while studying the place. While they were waiting to order, a man moved along the bar so they were standing next to Hazel. He was a head or more tall than her, rake thin, dressed mostly in leather with multicoloured dreadlocks on top of his head. Deathly pale, but very much alive. He flashed her a smile which showed off a pair of fangs that must have been glued on, given how seamless they looked. You look good enough to eat, he said, his mouth out of her ear, followed by a growl. Hazel pulled her head away and tried to give him a stern look but it was too hard to keep a straight face. She put a hand over her mouth to avoid outright laughing in his face, but as his smile sank into a sullen pout, she found herself laughing even harder. I wish I'd done that, Katie said. You know him? Did you... I told you I was big into the whole vampire thing, right? Hazel glanced back in the direction of the man as he stalked off. I know you're new to what vampires are really like, but still... What can I say? This isn't a, this isn't a place for wise life truces. She shrugged, 
Given her own history, she wasn't exactly able to judge. They stayed close to the bar for a while after getting their drinks, Hazel scanning the crowd for anything out of the ordinary. There were plenty of vampires around, and many of them less ridiculous looking than the man who had tried to chat him up. But they were all just people, with prosthetic fangs and perhaps coloured contact lenses. There were no actual vampires anywhere to be seen. Come on, let's dance, Katie said eventually. Before Hazel could argue, she had her by the hand and was pulling her towards the dance floor. They wound up in the middle of it. Hazel hesitated for several moments, certain the people were staring at her, judging her as a poser who didn't belong. She didn't wear these clothes or list this music, and it must have been obvious as if she had a neon sign flashing above her head. But then Katie was moving in time with the music, no sign of any inhibitions, and there was nothing for it but to join her. It really was just like any other club. Two women dancing together soon attracted a number of men, some hovering awkwardly nearby while others were more forward and thrust themselves into the middle of Hazel and Katie. Hazel found herself bumping up against one particularly good-looking man in a Victorian-style morning suit, but all in black. He was at least six foot five. His hair a natural brown tied back in a long ponytail, and even through his suit it was obvious that he had thick, muscular arms. When he put his arm around her while they danced, she almost forgot why she was there. Then she was aware of a commotion elsewhere in the club. Lots of frantic movements and shouting, barely audible above the music, which meant it must have been loud. Shortly, most people were looking and crowding to see what it was. Hazel turned to Katie and told her to stay where she was before forcing her way through the crowd. The music cut out and the lights went up. This only made the noise increase, as everybody clamoured to find out what was going on. Hazel could make no sense of it, except that lots of people were pointing in the direction of the door, so she made her way outside. There was one bouncer on the door, but he was standing inside the doorway and looking nervously down the street. Hazel gave him a quizzical look and he said, Wolves? Fucking hell, I really hope that bastard was having me on. Before she could make any sense of this, a man screamed. Hazel craned her head and saw him running up the street towards her, knocking down anyone who crossed his path. Most onlookers seemed confused and a few laughed until the wolf came into view. Then the screams spread and people fled in all directions. This only caused more collisions and sent more people falling. One young woman stumbled close to the animal. She wet herself and covered her eyes, crying. Hazel dashed forward. She leapt over the woman and landed on her hands, kicking the wolf's snout and sending it reeling with a yelp. Run! She yelled at the woman, when the only response was an uncomprehending stare, but her voice rose to a shriek. Get the fuck out of here! The woman staggered to her feet and fled. The wolf growled as it regained its feet. Hazel backed away and circled, more conscious than ever of the weight in her boots. While it might help when she landed a kick, it also risked slowing her down. Still, at least the wolf wouldn't stare at her chest. It moved in time with her, continuing to growl. Unlike regular wolves, there was no hair on its body. It was nearly eight feet long, with skin as black as coal. The growling stopped. Hazel braced, then threw herself right when it pounced. Both she and it recovered their balance and started circling again. The streets had cleared now. All the nearby club doors had been shut and the music shut off. Eyes peered from all available windows, watching her and the wolf circle each other. Somewhere nearby, sirens blared. The wolf lunged and Hazel dodged again. But it felt closer this time. From around the corner came the sound of horse hooves. Two police horses came into view both huffing and whinnying. The wolf let out a sharp bark that made Hazel jump. Both horses shrieked and threw their riders, running in opposite directions. Hazel had to roll out of the way again as the wolf picked one and pursued. She hesitated a moment. Further up the street, people continued to mill and move between clubs, as though a tangible border had been drawn between the wolf's mayhem and normalcy. She broke into a run after the wolf. She found it easily enough, shredding the inside of the horse in the middle of the road. It appeared oblivious to the cordon that had appeared around it, staffed by nervous police calling frantically on their radios. The cordon made onlookers hear that bit bolder and a crowd was quickly forming around the scene, taking photos on their phones. The wolf raised its head from the carcass and everyone took a step backwards. The beast let out a long, piercing howl. The sound sent goosebumps up Hazel's arm. For several moments, silence followed. 
Then the howl was answered. Once, twice, three times, more, until she lost count of how many and what direction they were coming from. Chapter 11 The wolf had now noticed the cordon around its kill, and the many warm bodies surrounding that, looking on in fear and fascination. Even as it lost interest in the horse carcass and paced in a slow circle, snarling, people continued to film and take pictures with their phones. The police on the cordon shifted nervously, clearly not wanting to be there or to have this huge mass of people blocking their escape. She was at the front of the crowd, ready to leap in if the wolf decided to do more than pace. It would, soon enough. It wasn't stopped. And the longer she waited with this one, the freer rain the others had to inflict untold damage. She had phoned Jack and he had said he'd put the guild's animal control team on it. But that hardly put her at ease until she actually saw them. A Sirens blaring, a police van screamed up to the crowd and skidded to a screeching halt, leaving its lights flashing. The wolf turned to the noise, growled and barked at it, a short, sharp sound which made her wince. Not a dog or even a wolf, but a monster. Now people appeared to realise that there were more important things than capturing the moments on their phones and began to shift and push backwards. If it attacked, the crowd would break, but still, some poor unfortunate would get caught. The crowd parted, and men in black body armour carrying guns appeared. Semi-automatic rifles. Supernatural or not, the wolf would be down and bleeding in a matter of moments. And once it died, it would revert, and everyone would be left staring at a bullet-riddled human body. Not only would that raise too many questions in the media, but it would leave a grieving family asking why they had trusted the guild with the safety and containment of their loved one in the first place. She forced her way forward, shoving aside the scared policeman who tried to stop her, and held her hands up. No! Stop! She heard somebody behind her call, Miss! Get back! And others shouting similar commands. A buzz went through the crowd. The armed police looked to their commanders, unsure of what to do. But Hazel's attention was on the wolf, which now turned its full attention to her. Before I could do more than look, she spun and caught it with two hard kicks to the jaw in quick succession. It yelped and toppled to the ground, legs flailing in the air. The police aimed their guns at it, and again she held up her hands at them. Don't! she yelled. Don't kill it! They hesitated, most likely because she was in the way rather than anything else. She moved to stand over the wolf and pin it down, pushing its jaw back so that it couldn't snap at her and straddling its stomach so that it couldn't right itself. It struggled hard, and she strained with the effort of holding it in place. The police came closer now. She couldn't hold them off and keep the beast down at the same time. She was going to lose this battle, and there would be too many eyewitnesses to deny exactly what this creature was. Then there was a rush of wind by her leg, and the wolf yelped. In a moment it was still. The police raised their guns and pointed across to the other side of the crowd. There. Another group of men in body armour stood holding tranquilizer guns. They lowered the weapons and raised their hands, but it didn't placate the police. What in Christ is going on? Somebody said. They stepped out into the cordon to reveal themselves as a grey-haired but still robust-looking man with a thick moustache. This is our jurisdiction officer, Jack said as he came forward, flashing a badge. He glanced at Hazel and nodded towards the crowd, indicating that she should move on quickly. She stood up off the prone animal. None of the police stopped the guild men who came to remove it from the scene, instead watching the commander argue with Jack. Hazel left them to it and headed over to the guild van, where she was glad to find a pair of jeans, a hoodie and a long and short metal baton. It would certainly make hunting the remaining wolves more practical and reduce the risk of her flashing onlookers. Once changed and armed, she headed off in the direction of the howling. Nat's body was recognisable from her clothing and her scent but she was a mess. The sledgehammer on the floor nearby explained the grey and red pulp that used to be her head, but not who was responsible. Gaz glanced back at the human, dared from having finally succumbed to the wounds Christoph had inflicted to discover where the walls were kept, but it was clear that he wouldn't have had the strength to get the best of her, let alone deliver the killing blow. So, the champion of man is declared for the other side, Christoph said. He's a vampire? Rice said. Yes, but no less than an enemy for it, it would seem. How? I do not know. Gaz shook his head. The blood loss when you first awaken is far too strong. To resist it is unprecedented. Christoph finished. 
The silence hung thick in the air. After a few minutes, several other vampires wearing overalls came into the back room to collect the bodies and clean the floor of blood. Gareth decided not to watch them and headed through the main room and outside. Bri joined him after a moment. You alright, mate? Gareth shrugged. Come on, I know you're not upset about Nat. No, I don't give a shit about Nat. He snapped. She was a fucking cow. That's not as if we lost some great thinker or fighter. All she was was some smug bitch whose main preoccupation was trying to make us look like dicks. When she wasn't riding wheels. They laughed. But it died out quickly enough. No. Gaz went on. What's bugging me is that I've been treating this champion of man as an abstract concept. Just some idea that would die and all we have to do is kill some lad. Easy, right? But now he's a vampire. And instead of bringing him to our side, it's made him stronger and more of a threat. Will and Nat were tits, but they were hardly brand new at this, were they? They weren't easy pickings. Somewhere in the distance, wolves howled. Look on the bright side, Bryce said. Maybe one of our new friends will do better. I hope so, Gaz said, grinning as he looked at the sky and willed the wolves to tear open the champion of man's ribcage and feast on his heart. The sun was just beginning to rise. Hazel's body was battered and bruised, her limbs heavy and aching. She grunted with the effort of raising the blade up in front of her. The wolf showed no signs of tiring, stamping its front paws on the ground and growling at her. She circled, waiting for it to pounce, willing her arms to stop trembling. Out of nowhere, the wolf yelped. It collapsed to the floor and its body started convulsing. She lowered her baton and stepped towards it watching as it curled up in a fetal position. Its body shrank and its skin shriveled. Its claws retreated into what became hands. Its snout collapsed, the face cracking and thick black blood pouring away from the wounds. The wolf pawed at its face and the flesh peeled away, revealing human features covered by blood and mucus beneath. Hazel returned her baton to its sheath and rubbed her eyes. When she looked down, the wolf was gone and a young woman lay in its place, her naked body covered in blood and slime. The wolf's skin and flesh lay around her in flakes and chunks. She was shivering and barely conscious. Hazel looked away from the woman and over the railings nearby. The sun had now risen above the horizon, but was still low enough that the dock was bathed in orange light. Over to her left, the lights on top of the police car still flashed silently. The bodies of its occupants and several civilians were strewn about on the grass verge next to the pump house tavern. She could feel the eyes of everyone barricaded inside, watching her intently. It should be safe now, she shouted. Get this woman a blanket. When she heard the door's bolt being released, her legs gave and she dropped to her knees. Miles squeezed as much water as he could out of the cloth into the sink, then wiped it over the gash on his forearm. He winced, enduring the sting until the wound was clean. He raised his arm to examine it in the mirror. The skin was starting to knit together, slowly, but he could still see bone. He dropped the cloth into the sink and pulled the plug out. Downstairs, the door clicked open. He grabbed his t-shirt and pulled it back on before heading out of the bathroom. Miles? Lydia's voice called up the stairs. Miles, are you in? Up here? He shouted. He wandered over to the stairs and headed down. Just recovering from west wrestling with werewolves, believe it or not. Jess? She stood at the bottom of the stairs next to Lydia. Her eyes wide, staring at him. Miles? He could hear her breath become low and shallow. Miles, you... It's you. Is it you? Lydia lowered her head and shoved her hands into her pockets and stuck, took a step to one side. It's me. Miles glanced at her, then back at Jess. Lydia, tell you? When Jess nodded, he said, Well, that saves the awkward conversation, at least. So, I guess, uh... Hi? Jess threw her arms around him and squeezed. He returned the hug. Her whole body was trembling. He could hear her heart racing, the sound reverberating in his ears. He, he brought a hand up to her face and used his thumb to wipe the tears from her cheek. Jess lifted her eyes to meet his. He smiled. She slapped him across the face. He winced, his ears ringing over the sound of his sister's heartbeat. You should have told me you were back. I am? Sooner? 
Fucking hell, Jess. I woke up naked and feral on an autopsy table just the night before last. She flinched and he sighed. Shit, sorry. Look, I did go looking for you all. I found Lydia and she had a concussion, so I had to look after her and then... Well, here we are now. Okay. She laughed. He has fallen down her cheeks. I guess that's fair enough, in the sense that all of this is completely balmy and makes no sense whatsoever. I mean... Myers caught Lydia's eye and inclined his head towards the living room. Why don't we sit down? Lydia put her hand around Jess's shoulders and led her through. Miles touched Lydia's arm and mouthed, thank you, getting a smile in response. Jess, have I been, you know, am I officially dead? What do you... Oh, Jess shook her head before sitting down. I identified your... Jesus, I identified your body, but I haven't told mum and dad, so I guess not. Oh, that's something. Would the paperwork be finished and catch up with him at some point anyway? He remembered the carnage in the mortuary after he had awoken and decided that it probably wouldn't. He looked at Lydia. Did you tell the guild about me? Yeah. I don't know how convinced they were by the concept of you not being a monster. But they agreed to discuss it once the werewolves were all dealt with. Which reminds me. Miles lifted his arm. The wound had now healed to the extent that it looked just like a light scratch. I hope vampires are immune to lycanthropy. Are you okay? Jess asked, leaning forward. I'll live. Well, you know what I mean. Neither Jess nor Lydia appreciated the joke. Sorry. We can find out when we meet up with them, Lydia said. There's a lot of answers we need from them, I think. They fell silent. Miles' eyes shifted from Lydia to Jess and back again. Both were tense. Jess still leaning forward with her hands gripping her knees and Lydia sitting very rigidly, her eyes flicking to the floor whenever Miles looked at her. Do you really drink blood? Jess's voice sounded too loud in the quiet of the living room. A laugh escaped Miles' mouth. Yeah, I guess I do. Actually, I should probably pick some more up this morning. I don't know how long the craving will stay away for. Jess stood up and walked over to Miles. She took his head in both hands and kissed him on the forehead. I'm so glad you're back, he said, but he could still see the doubt in her eyes. Miles' hand brushed Lydia's as they walked towards Cyclade's house. He felt her flinch and pull her arm away. He let his hand hang there and scratched at his leg. Sorry, she whispered. It's just that I haven't... I know, sorry, I shouldn't have... Kit was waiting for them at the door. Jess took and squeezed Kit's hand with a smile on her face when she reached him. Miles looked at Lydia. When did that happen? Lydia shrugged. All right, Mike, Kit said. So the rumours are true then? All right, Kit. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Nice one. Their emotional range astounds me, Jess said to Lydia as they walked in the door. They headed up in the lift to the fifth floor. We're in a largely sparse open room with a television in one corner and a bunch of tables and chairs dotted around. They found a small cluster of people huddled up together. Lydia's brother-in-law Jack was the only familiar face. They'd been talking, idle chatter by the sound of it, but as soon as Miles entered the room it fell silent. Miles cast his eyes around the room and saw that the faces that weren't openly hostile were on edge. You're Miles? He didn't recognise the man the voice belonged to but his face looked familiar in a way he couldn't put his finger on. The champion? The vampire? The young, auburn-haired woman who had been with Jack the day after Paddy's murder. Hazel, Lydia said her name was. I can sense it, feel it. Nice to meet you, Miles said, trying to grin. Hazel's frown hardened. I'm still not sure why we're entertaining this charade. It's not a person, and we should be killing it. Hey! Lydia shouted. First of all, he's not a fucking it, okay? His name's Miles. We've been over this. Miles put his hand out in front of her. Lydia, it's okay. He looked back at the woman who had spoken. Alright, I can understand why you think the way you do, but... He gestured. Jack was there when I woke up. He saw what happened. I haven't drank any human blood. I won't. I can't without vacating this body, so 
something else can set up shop in here. He's not lying, the first man said, looking at him in a way that Mars wasn't sure he liked. He's still got his human soul. How do you... Miles' words faded away as another woman stood up and walked over to the first man. She was extremely beautiful, but that wasn't why he found himself staring. He was olive skinned, but there was a shimmer about her that made it glow like gold. The scent of fresh flowers filled his nostrils. A resonance like a tuning fork being struck rang in his ears. He glanced around the room, but nobody else was reacting. Their attention was still focused on him. Miles? The woman said. My name is Anil. This is Puth. We've been looking for you. We want to help you fulfill your role as the champion of man. We trusted him, Hazel said. Yes, and I, Lydia, and Jess all said at once. I've got some psychic ability, Puth said. Nothing special, but enough to know that we can trust him. He's on our side. Nothing special, Mars thought dryly. But then, was mind reading special when vampires, werewolves and more were real? Come off it, Hazel snapped. This is a joke. She clenched her fists, looking as though she was spoiling for a fight. All right, look, Jack said. We have a lot to discuss and work through, but we're not going to do that by yelling at each other, are we? Hazel didn't respond. She didn't look too ready to accept him, and she wasn't the only one. But nobody moved against him either. For now, it would do, but as the silence following Jack's words drew out, it grew pregnant with the possibility that this strange truce wouldn't hold. The impasse needed to be broken. Okay, so say I'm this champion of man that you're about, he said. What does that mean? Or, to put it another way, who am I up against? Puth and Niall shared a look that he couldn't decipher. Did you hear about the earthquake in Israel not too long ago? In a place called Tal Megiddo? Puth said. The night Michelle died? He shoved away the all too familiar memory even as it rose. Not just an earthquake then? Sadly not. The earthquake wasn't a natural phenomenon. The city-state of Tal Megiddo was built up on top of a gateway to hell, which is exactly what it sounds like. And that gateway was opened. He heard Jess mutter under her breath. This is unreal. I'm going mad. And... Miles said... And... Puth sighed and shot another look at Anile. About a century ago, a very old and very powerful vampire called Noir de Iron Dawn was trapped in that gateway. When it was opened, he got out. Miles looked from Puth to Anile and back. That's it? What? Anile said. All this panic is over one vampire? He's not just one vampire. If it wasn't for him, there wouldn't be any vampires today. He was the first, two millennia ago, the father of the whole dynasty. And she trailed off, giving Miles a wary look. And after a pause, she sighed. And when he was alive, he was a champion of man. There wasn't much Miles could say to that besides. Oh. Thank you very much for listening. If you've enjoyed this and you want more, then you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, AK Black and Red, or search for From the Hill of Megado on your favourite podcast series. Next week, we'll be going into chapters 12 through 14 and finding out more about what supernatural curiosities the world is hiding beneath its surface. See you then.